Sometimes when I'm writing a sermon, I get to feeling stuck. Like I can't get started even, much less get finished. I Sometimes when I'm that way, I just do a Google search and look at what comes up. This week I Googled a lot of keywords, but the main two were finished and race. This week, that meant I spent a long time contemplating race and racism. Not because that was my intended theme, but because a racially motivated killing once again dominated the news cycle. In Minneapolis, the trial began for Derek Chauvin, who knelt on George Floyd's neck for nine minutes until he was dead. And then the stories broke in Atlanta. Eight people shot dead in spas, six of them Asian women. While the initial reports were that the shooter himself claims that he was not racially motivated, a closer look reveals the sad reality of bias and hatred directed toward Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders in our country. There has been a huge surge in hate crimes and slurs against Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders over the last year. This is particularly due to certain public figures and politicians who chose to characterize the coronavirus as the China virus or the Kung flu. But more broadly, it's because America has never come to terms with its treatment of Asian Americans and racism. Frequently, persons of Asian heritage are lumped together into a vague category of other with little care for our history in terms of their ancestry, their immigration, or even country of origin of their ancestors or they themselves. As happens with Black Americans, Asian Americans frequently experience they're not seen as individuals that they all look alike or that they're erased or stereotyped as a so-called model minority. Asian women in America particularly are viewed with a mixture of admiration and suspicion as if they are exotic displays in a kind of suggestive sideshow. The heartbreaking stories coming out of Atlanta reminded me, reminded us that the work of anti-racism is far from finished. Of course, the origin of that use of the term race is completely different from the kind of race that the Apostle Paul is describing. The race he describes is more like the ones in the other news story that caught my eye this week, the death of Dick Hoyt. Dick Hoyt pushed his son Rick's wheelchair in more than 1,000 races around the world, including 72 marathons and 257 triathlons. They ran the Boston Marathon 32 times between 1980 and 2014. Rick was unable to move his arms or legs due to severe cerebral palsy, but he loved how the races made him feel as if he had no disability at all. The Apostle Paul used often this metaphor of running a race, a race which he said he had not yet finished, but one which he ran with endurance, with a single-minded commitment to the goal, with a clarity of purpose that kept him intent on his work and often intense in his words. The work he did, he did for Christ. Paul was willing to pour himself out like a libation, like a sacrifice, just as Christ was poured out when he finished his work on the cross. Paul imagines himself on an Olympic track, running not a sprint but a marathon to carry the good news of Jesus to every place that he could. For the apostle, this race he runs is not an individual competition with only one winner. It's no, it's almost like a big giant relay with disciplined runners completing their leg and then passing the baton on to the next runners. This requires discipline, conditioning, and single-minded commitment. He runs not to win God's favor, but in order to share God's grace with more people. And Paul ran 
until, as he says in this passage, he finished the race. When Jesus drew his last breath on the cross, he was completing an important part of his work. And for us, his life and death and resurrection completed our salvation. When he said, it is finished, he knew that his incarnation had accomplished the work of grace. His work in that moment was finished. But ours was only beginning. Because Jesus bids us to come and follow him, to take up our cross and follow him, to leave behind all the faint praise of the world, all the shiny material awards and medals, all the earthly goods that turn to rust and ashes. In weeks like this one, we may be finding it hard to keep following Jesus, feeling weighed down with grief. We might, like Paul did at times, find it hard to keep on. In these last few days, I've remembered one of the lesser known versions of the old hymn, What a Friend We Have in Jesus, which by the way, just to correct Google, um, Alan Jackson did not compose. But the verse goes, Are we weak and heavy laden, cumbered with a load of care? Precious Savior, still our refuge. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Friends, the work of the cross is finished, and in it, the death of Jesus and we can see and know that he is with us every step of the way. We are still running our race, setting aside the sin and shame that weigh on us, keeping our eyes fixed on him, knowing that we are not running in vain. We run with perseverance. As Dr. King said, moving forward, he said, if you can't fly, then run. If you can't run, then walk. If you can't walk, then crawl. But whatever you do, you have to keep moving forward. We keep on. Even when we think we cannot go on. Or to quote the Navy SEAL David Goggins book, he said, don't stop when you're tired. Stop when you're finished. We continue our work, knowing that each step we take, each time we sustain those who run alongside us, each word of encouragement we share with another, each act of goodness, no matter how large or small, all of it is for Jesus, for love of him, for his glory. Our race is not yet run. Our work is not yet done. And so we keep on. We press on until we can say it is finished. Amen.